Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. This is another Two Minute Tuesday. We have a brand new article just went up by Dr. Baraki, Dr. Michael Ray, and Dr. Derek Miles. It's on scapular dyskinesia, and we're going to spend the next two minutes talking about what it is, what it isn't, and where to go from here. So, without further ado, let's get it rolling. All right, so to begin with, we need to cover some anatomy just to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. So first off is the scapula. The scapula is a triangle-shaped flat bone that sits uh, underneath a bunch of muscle tissue on the back and it connects to the arm or the humerus, your upper arm bone. And that articulates or connects as a joint at the glenohumeral joint. The idea is that the glenohumeral joint, uh, that is this part of the scapula and the humerus together, move in a correct fashion and this is sometimes termed a glenohumeral rhythm or scapulohumeral rhythm. And if you think we're just making this up, this is all over the internet. Starting to go over something called scapulohumeral rhythm, which basically means how the scapula is enough. Enough of all that stuff. So obviously this is out there in the internet, but what does it even mean? So the idea is that the scapula must upwardly rotate, posteriorly tilt, and externally rotate in the correct manner along with the humerus in order to avoid rotator cuff injury, pain, uh, tendinopathies, and other sort of issues that people get in their shoulder joint or get diagnosed with anyway, like shoulder impingement syndrome. In this article series, we're gonna try to go through one by one some of these common diagnoses and figure out are they a thing if so, what should we do about them? And if they're not a thing, how do we move forward? The underlying assumption is that the normal scapulohumeral rhythm or glenohumeral rhythm is well-defined in humans and that any uh, abnormal movement uh, it predisposes one to pain. So if we just look at studies that are trying to investigate the normal scapulohumeral rhythm, we see a ton of problems. Okay, so first problem is you're trying to measure a three-dimensional movement across multiple axes, and that's hard. Even when we're using like bone pins and motion analysis and x-ray technology, this is not very easy to do. And even using those techniques, it's really hard to determine what type of movements are actually happening um, and how reliable that is from person to person. There's also a huge variation due to anthropometry and sizes of muscles and sizes of bones and all this other stuff amongst individuals themselves. Also in these studies, as you might expect, the sample sizes are relatively small. So it's hard to make that generalizable to these large swaths of the population. Also, there's a thing called transient dyskinesia. I don't know who came up with that term, but uh, the shoulder, the muscles of the shoulder actually become fatigued via training or exercise. And then you can actually exhibit some of the symptoms of scapular dyskinesia after training or exercise. So swimmers, for instance, close to 80% of them after a swim practice uh, uh, basically exhibited some form of scapular dyskinesia, but none of them had any pain. Same thing happened with tennis players, other people who were untrained who had to do a throwing exercise. These are all cited and listed in the article, so make sure that you read that if you're interested. Um, and we talked about the variation between individuals. The biggest issue, though, is the inconsistency in findings of scapular scapular movement and the scapular humeral rhythm, uh, even in the setting of diagnosed shoulder pathology. So for instance, there's nine studies that looked at people who were diagnosed with shoulder impingement syndrome, and they compared the amount of upward rotation of the scapula they had compared to people who weren't diagnosed uh, with uh, uh, shoulder impingement syndrome. So four of those studies, four of the nine studies, showed decreased uh, upward rotation. One study showed increased rotation, and the rest showed no difference. And the again, the idea is that you're trying to determine via physical exam, does this scapular movement, scapular humeral rhythm accurately or reliably, or both really, do that predict that somebody's gonna have a shoulder issue so that you could intervene early on? Or if somebody comes in with a shoulder issue, shoulder pain or other diagnoses, does something in the scapular mechanics, uh, is there something that you can do with that to fix or mitigate the problem, some sort of training management or, or corrective exercise or something like that? we can't even figure out reliably what movements are associated with certain pathologies uh, because it doesn't appear that there is any connection. And probably the most interesting part of this review, and again, I encourage you guys all to go over and read this article. That's why I made this video to 
push you guys over there to read that article. Even when diagnosed, even when there are the scapular dyskinesia is diagnosed uh, and then treated to the point of pain improvement, okay? Scapular mechanics don't change, meaning they diagnosed people with the scapular dyskinesia and these people had shoulder pain and then they treated them. Even with scapular focused movements, the mechanics of the scapulate did not change. So the training intervention targeted towards changing scapular movement didn't actually change the motion of the scapula and the pain abated regardless. So all this brings us to the bottom line. Scapular dyskinesia is probably not a real thing uh, in that it cannot be reliably diagnosed, nor does it reliably predict pain, injury, or other dysfunction. Its diagnosis does not offer any meaningful insight into the cause or subsequent appropriate management of any shoulder pathology, meaning that if you're diagnosed with a scapular movement problem, that's meaningless because not only is the treatment unlikely to change that movement, but changing that movement is unlikely to actually improve your symptoms. The pain is likely going to get better either due to its natural course, that's pain tends to improve over time anyway, or from some other mechanism. Uh, a final thought to conclude this video and get you guys to chew on. When we look critically at pain and injury data, we fail to see clear evidence that movement quality or movement wrong is a major contributor. We also fail to see that attempts to correct the allegedly offensive movement does anything to improve outcomes. Does this change how we think about exercise technique and pain? Let us know in the comments below. So if you guys dug the video, make sure that you hit like, subscribe for all the latest content, make sure you head over to the website, read this article, it is great, and this article series is going to be fire. We appreciate you guys joining us here on the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. Again, I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum, signing off, see you guys next time.